First Peter chapter four. First Peter four. We're going to be talking about one of those topics that has caught the church at large and and captured the thinking, and that concerns spiritual gifts. And you say spiritual gifts, and people get all warm and fuzzy, and others others panic. I don't know what my spiritual gift is. And I just want to say to everybody, and we can say it to our world, calm down. Calm down, relax. We're going to straighten that out today. The title of the sermon today is God's Gifts Are Given to Glorify Him. I remember the spiritual gifts tests, the spiritual gifts analysis, the spiritual gift. Everybody's got to know their gift. And I got caught up into that for a while. And I thank God that I've, by his grace, he's matured me beyond that. But it's a trap because somehow we begin to think that when we're serving in the gift, several things happen. Number one, God is most glorified when I am serving in my gift. No. Second thing that happens, I'm most energized when I'm serving in my gift. No. It goes so far as one author wrote, Jesus meeting with the woman at the well, the disciples went away to get food. They came back and, they, and he says to them, I have food that you do not know of. And, and the author concludes, Jesus was operating in his gift and was fulfilled by it. And I want to say, no, he's the author of all gifts. He has them all, has every gift, gifts we don't understand. But I want to help you today. And Peter wants to help his struggling, suffering readers to understand the purpose of gifts, which gifts are important, how do you use them? Wouldn't you love the answer to that? Stand with me. 1 Peter chapter 4, I want to begin reading at verse 7 through verse 11. We're going to be looking at verses 10 and 11, but 7 through 11. Peter says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You can be seated. Let me, let me start by affirming that spiritual gifts are a part of God's plan for his church. They are a part of God's plan for his church. And in no way are we minimizing spiritual gifts or declaring that you don't need to, to uh, understand that spiritual gifts are given by the Spirit. They are. But let's put them in the right place. So let me, let me clarify or correct, if you will, Three things that I think are, are common misunderstandings about spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are often misunderstood. Number one, spiritual gifts, this is a way that, that they're often misunderstood. They don't make my standing before God better if I use them, or worse, if I don't use them. So, so you're not, in, and I am not in a better standing before God if I use them. He doesn't smile on me more if I use them or smile on me less if I don't use them. If we declare that somehow God is pleased with us when we serve in our gifts or not pleased with us when we don't serve in our gift, we've become legalists. 
We've declared a, a law that God does not declare anywhere in Scripture. God is not more pleased when I serve Him than when I don't. He's pleased with me, not because of my works, but because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. I am in Christ, therefore God is pleased with me. I don't have to do anything to please Him. Faith in Christ alone pleases the Father. Because Jesus Christ alone pleases the Father. Galatians chapter 2, six, verse 16 says, You know that a person is not justified by works by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, so that we also have believed in, we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Doesn't matter whose law it is, by the way, mine or God's, they don't justify us. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So if we can get in our brain today, works don't matter in my pleasing of God for justification. He loves me in Christ. That's enough. So, second misunderstanding. Spiritual gifts are not meant for my spiritual or emotional well-being. The spiritual gifts weren't given so that I can feel good about myself, so that I can feel fulfilled, so that I can be energized, so that I can do all these wonderful things and feel good. They're not meant for that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 says, to each, and Paul goes, he's talking a lot about spiritual gifts, chapter 12, chapter 14, but in the middle, chapter 13, all about love. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Get this in our brain. Spiritual gifts are not about me. They're not about me. They're about God and others. They're not about me. So they're not meant to make me feel good. They're not meant to energize me or to fulfill me. They're meant for others because God gave them. Three, the third misconception. Spiritual gifts are not found through gifts testing. Okay, I, I just need to say that one more time. Spiritual gifts are not found through gifts testing. Here's why. An atheist can take a spiritual gifts test and be told which spiritual gift that atheist has. Therefore, it's not a spiritual gift. Spiritual gifts are spiritual. And only people in Christ are spiritual. Therefore, it's not, we don't understand our gifts by taking a test. Look at, look at Matthew chapter 7. Jesus is going through and, and talking about false teachers. They come in sheep's clothing, but they're really ravenous wolves. And he gives all these, these uh, statements about what a false teacher looks like. It, it's a tree that looks beautiful, but bears bad fruit. And that a tree that God plants always bears good fruit. And then in chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, he says this about these false teachers. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? That seems like a pretty good spiritual gift, wouldn't you think? And how about this? And cast out demons in your name. And if that's not enough, Lord, we did mighty works in your name. Look, we were serving in our gift. We did it all for Jesus. And Jesus' response uh, is to them is, then I will tell them, I will declare to them, 
I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So, so let, me, let me just state this. If our emphasis is spiritual gifts, we're off base from the beginning. If our emphasis is figuring out what gift God has made us, we're off base from the beginning. So Peter's going to help us understand how we serve others. Spiritual gifts, by the way, are only, only for building up the church. Only for building up the church. That's all. We, at, the, at the risk of sounding like I don't care about the lost, which I do, we've emphasized going out into the community almost to the exclusion of building up the body of Christ. It's not about numbers. It's about spiritual growth. It's about making sure the body of Christ is, is unified and growing together. So the Apostle Paul, concluding all this emphasis on, wrong emphasis on spiritual gifts from the church of Corinth, he says, So with yourselves, since you're eager for the manifestation of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Now that's important because these are the same people who were laughing at immorality. These are the same people that were taking one another to court. These are the same people that were gossiping and slandering. These are the same people that were backbiting and fighting. And, and Paul says to this church at Corinth that was a wreck, if you want to excel in a gift, focus on building up the body of Christ, the local church, your church, Corinth. Focus on unity and not division. Focus on others and not self. Excel in building up the church. So let's move on to our text then. Peter wants his readers to focus on the primary gift. Yes, there's a primary gift. It's called grace. That's the primary gift. Grace is the primary gift. See, because it's God's gift of grace that places us into his family. It's, it's his gift of grace that places us into his family. We don't even have a church without grace. How do you know it's grace? Well, 1 Peter 4.10 doesn't come out and say the word grace, but it helps us understand that it's grace because in 1 Peter 4.10, Peter writes this, as each has received a gift, use it. The word, it's one word in the Greek, a gift in English. It's the same root from which we get the word grace, gift, charisma, charis, grace. This gift is singular, and the word it is singular. So turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans 5, verses 15 through 17. Paul also helps us understand this singular gift. Romans 5, 15 through 17, but the free gift... Again, gift, charisma, charis, grace. The free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abound for many. And the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin, 
For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Grace is a gift. We're saved by grace through faith. Paul goes on in Romans, you don't have to turn there, but Romans 6.23, you probably can quote it, it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Grace is a gift that always leads to eternal life. We're not talking about common grace. We're talking about saving grace. Saving grace is a gift that always leads to eternal life. Believers are to use God's gift of grace in their lives. He saved me by his grace to serve one another. So if he saved me by his grace, I need to be a person who extends grace. If you can't identify your spiritual gift, and I'm not saying you should even try, if you can't identify your spiritual gift, can you at least be gracious and kind? Can you extend grace? Well, yes, as a believer. No, if you're not a believer. First Peter 4.10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. God's grace ought to flow through us toward one another. We ought to be the most gracious, kind, forgiving, loving people on planet earth. Not legalistic, not uh, backbiting and slandering, but loving and kind. He says to serve one another. Interesting word, the word serve. The root of that word is the word we get our de word deacon from. So we ought to be, in a non-official sense, deacons to one another. The word serve means to render assistance or help by performing certain duties, often of a humble or menial nature. Now, here's the problem with spiritual gifts test. You can look at that need and go, eh, it's not really my gift. Here's the point. Did God show that need to you? Then you're the one that's a steward of it. Start showing grace. Stop explaining it away as it's not my gift. The text that was read earlier, Matthew chapter 25, verses 44 and 45. Let me read that those verses to you. Jesus is talking to those who are not uh, going to enter heaven. And he says, they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did, you see, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Same word. Did not serve you. Then he will answer them, saying, truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. One of the least of these who? Not the world. It's not about giving to the person holding a sign up that says homeless. Now, should we have compassion? Absolutely. That's not our first priority. As a church, the world is not our first priority. We are our first priority. Now, that is counterintuitive and countercultural, but that's scriptural. We'll get to that soon. We know that he's talking about brothers because back in verse 40, Jesus is talking about to those who 
do go to heaven. And he said, when you do it to the least of these, my brothers. That little, my brothers, is simply omitted from the last part, but it's implied because it's the same qualification that he's talked about to those who are going to heaven. When God shows you a need, extend grace. When God shows you a situation, extend grace in the church first. See, receiving a gift, the gift of grace, makes each Christian a steward of that gift. We're stewards of the gift of grace. Grace isn't something that God just zaps us with once, and then it's done. God's saving grace is on us every single day, for without it, we would perish. His grace sustains us, it upholds us, it keeps us in his love. And he never removes it from those who are in Christ. So verse 10 again of 1 Peter 4, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. A steward is one who has the authority and responsibility for something. Someone who's in charge, an administrator or a manager. As believers in Jesus Christ who've been saved by grace, we are now managers or administrators of the grace that God has given us. We're stewards of that. It isn't something that simply is ours and we cling to it without any regard to anybody else. It's ours so that it flows through us to one another in the church. We ought to be gracious and kind to one another. We ought to be meeting the needs of others. We ought to be looking for ways that we can encourage others. And then Peter uses this word varied. Stewards of this varied gift. Varied signifies not only saving grace, but also other spiritual gifts which believers have which minister to the particular needs of struggling and suffering Christians. Now, don't let your mind go back to, well, now I've got to figure out what my gift is. No, you don't. Because it's not about figuring out your gift. It's about seeing an opportunity and ministering, period. Serving. Forget the gift. You've either got it or don't, and God will sustain you as we're going to see. The Baker exegetical commentary made this statement. There is no reason to think that the specific spiritual gifts delineated by Paul are excluded from Peter's thought, but neither is Peter concerned with those particular manifestations of God's grace. It doesn't matter. So let's back off of the spiritual gifts train and, and let's think about this fact. You're saved by the greatest gift you'll ever receive, and that is gift through Jesus Christ himself, who died on your behalf to save you from eternal hell. God sustains you with that saving grace. If he does that for you, how much more should you be doing that? Ministering to others who don't necessarily deserve it or even appreciate it at the time. So 1 Peter 1, 6 helps us understand how we use our gift in various ways. Chapter 1, verse 6 of 1 Peter, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So let me put this together for you. These suffering exiles that Peter's writing to are suffering various trials. The church has opportunities in various ways to meet the various trials that each person's going through. It's the church's responsibility to step up and step in and minister to those who are struggling and suffering. Let me clarify it a little bit with Scripture. 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, not just want, 
but actual need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? So, so in this struggling, suffering church, these Christians that Peter's writing to, who've been scattered all over the place, they are elect exiles. Peter's saying, look, you're, when, when someone comes to your church and they come to faith in Jesus Christ, they come with all of their troubles. And as a church family, jump in, minister to them, help them grow, be kind and gracious to them. James chapter 2, verses 15 and 16 James says, if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? How hypocritical to simply say, I'll pray for you. When you have the opportunity given by God, you're a steward of grace Jump in, meet the need. But I don't know if I can. Well, let's move on. Whatever a Christian says or does should be for the glory of God. Everything we do should be for the glory of God. We will fail miserably. But don't quit. It's not an excuse. Whatever you say, whatever you do, keep growing in the Lord, and what you say and what you do should bring glory to God. So, so Peter says, so when you speak, when you're speaking to this suffering, struggling believer, speak according to the Word of God. Stop pulling things out of your own imagination. Speak truth according to the Word. So that's what Peter says in verse 11, whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. This word oracles is logia. We get our word logos from it or word, but the oracle actually has to do with the content of the word. So when you speak, don't go against Scripture. Make sure that you're in line with what the Bible says. Baker, exegetical commentary, once again said, Those who teach about Christ and offer counsel in His name must understand themselves to be representing God's words to the community. Therefore, those who speak must understand that they are engaged in serious business that restrains them from positing merely their own human speculation. So, so one of the things that we have to do as Christians who are going to be ministering to people who are struggling, who are suffering, and we want to come alongside them, is we have to make sure we know the Scriptures. Now, caution. That doesn't mean that you should remain ignorant of the Scriptures. It means that when God gives you an opportunity and you don't know how to handle it, you don't know what to say, that's God's opportunity to teach you how you should respond. So when you're in over your head and you don't know how to respond to this person, you're like, I don't know what to say. Go back to the scriptures. Get counsel from those who, who are more mature, mature, spiritually mature than you and, and get the right answer so that the next time or you can go back to that person and you can talk to them about the things of God. The writer of Hebrews said this in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 to 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers... You need someone to teach you, again, the basic principles of the oracles of God. Th those things contained in Scripture. You're, you're missing it. You ought to know them by now. You've been saved long enough. You ought to know what the Bible says and how to help others with it. You need milk instead, he says. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he's the child 
but solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So in other words, the only way you're going to grow is when you're in the deep end. You got to get in the deep end. You can't declare yourself a swimmer by standing in the kiddie pool. You're not a swimmer. When you're at the deep end, you're a struggling swimmer until you learn how to swim more proficiently. And you keep honing that skill. That's what God's word is. Get in the deep end. Struggle with truth. And don't be satisfied with thinking that you have the truth when you may not actually know it. I thank God that even through many years of ministry, God has sought fit to grow me and change me and mature me in my thinking and understanding of Scripture. And I'm not ashamed to say I'm not where I was 10 years ago. So no pastor has ever arrived unless he's dead. No pastor has ever arrived. And any pastor who doesn't change his theology to be more consistent with the Scripture is a pastor who's stuck and not growing. We ought to always be growing. So when we speak to suffering, struggling believers, we need to come alongside them and give them the principles of the Word you know, and, and, and it's, it's okay to say, I can't remember the address of the verse, but here's what it says. Or you might say, here's a big section. Let me sum it up for you. This is what God is saying. And, and you talk to people. We live in a wonderful day with computers. And when you're, when you're dealing with someone, you, you might say, I don't know the answer, but hang on a second. I'm going to look on the computer, do a search. There are, there are Bible tools you have at your disposal if you're a computer person. And with a, a couple, type in a couple key words, hit enter, you can find a myriad of verses that will help you. But don't just cherry pick verses. Go back and look at the context. Make sure you're not misapplying the Scriptures. Make sure that when you, as a believer, as a steward of God's grace, are trying to help a struggling, suffering Christian, that you're actually using Scripture right because you're a steward of that verse. You're a steward of the Word. But I don't know how to do it. I don't know if I'm strong enough. Perfect. When, when serving, struggling sufferers, when we're serving these struggling sufferers, serve with the strength which God supplies through the ordinary means of the preaching of the Word. Take your notes. Take the notes that you do have. Go over them. Take the text that was studied. Study it again. The ordinary means of the preaching of the word. The, verse 11, whoever serves, serves as, serve as one or serves by the strength that God supplies. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. How does God supply the strength? It's not mystical. There are times when at the, the, the moment of uh, people talking or accusing or whatever, Bible verses just happen to come back. That's God ministering. But they have to be in there first. He's not going to simply give you a scripture you haven't studied. So apply the word to the heart. Make sure that when you're in those moments and the Spirit of God is working and bringing those verses back to your mind, that they're in there to begin with. But the point of this is, it isn't about some mystical strength that's going to just, you know, puff you up. It's about reliance upon the Word of God. And that's why the church is important. The preaching of the Word. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Paul said, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than 
all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. There is a power at work within every believer. We're saved by grace, and that grace is powerful because it's, we have the Spirit of God. And, and the Spirit of God uses the Word of God. Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. We are strengthened by the scriptures and by the preaching of the word. That's why the Sunday preaching of the word is so important. The Sunday preaching of the word is where we find our strength. Where we find where we find that we are we are built up and we're encouraged and, and so we want, to, we want to take what we've been given on a Sunday. We want to meditate on it, and we want to think about that. I'm also reminded of Ephesians, or Hebrews 4, where Paul says in verse 12, the word of God is living and powerful. And then he goes on, the writer of Hebrews, I didn't say Paul. I may have thought that, but the writer of Hebrews um, the Word of God is living and powerful. And then it talks about what it does. It, it, it goes right to the motivation of the thoughts of our hearts. So when we're, when we're in a body and we've committed to that body of believers, God is going to bring suffering, struggling Christians into our lives. So if we go to church wanting the church to be all about us, me individually, if you're sitting there and you think the church is about me, I need this from the church, your focus is already off. Because God put you in the church, not primarily for you, but for you to minister to others. Make sure that you strive and excel for those things that build up the church. The spiritual gifts aren't about us. They're about God. And we don't need to know our spiritual gifts to be able to minister to others. We don't need to know them. We just need to minister. There are things we enjoy more. But I shouldn't just look for the things that I enjoy more. Sometimes... I just need to get into the muck and mire of people's lives, and it's no fun. But we need to minister and serve. So whether we're speaking the oracles of God or serving the needs of the body of Christ, do it all for the glory of God. Do it all for the glory of God. Whether you're speaking to people or whether you're serving people, the goal is the glory of God. Verse 11, 1 Peter 4, 11, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Peter, Paul said this in Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In word or in deed. Or, or Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. God will give you the strength that you need to minister to these struggling, suffering believers. But he'll give you the strength when you need it, not before. So, in all this, in all that I do, one of the things that's going to help you and me go forward in ministering to others is having a word or a song of praise to God on our heart. Some of you are more given to music than others. Some of you aren't given to music at all. Some of you realize that you're not given to music at all. But you can still have that song in your heart. You can still have that word in your heart. And, and Peter closes this little section. He's not done yet. The letter's going to go on. But in the middle, he breaks out into this song, if you will, a doxology. 
And he concludes this section on serving with the grace of God to others who are struggling. He, he, concludes, he concludes it this way. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Not a long song, but enough. Again, the Baker exegetical commentary said, even though Peter's readers may feel powerless within the hostile situations they face, the doxology reminds them that all power belongs to the God they serve in the name of Jesus Christ. One of the cool things about the scriptures is that there are at least 16 doxologies in the New Testament. At least 16. Most of them end in amen. So in your search engine, when you pull up that Bible app, just type in the word amen, hit enter, and the verses will come up. Isn't that cool? There's no excuse for not knowing them. There's at least 16. Begin to memorize them. Begin to memorize some of, some of these are like five words. You should be able to memorize them. Begin to memorize them and it will strengthen you in your service to others. Let me read one of those to you in conclusion, which I do not yet have memorized. But I want to read it to you in conclusion. The book of Hebrews. You can turn there. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. A doxology. Stand with me and we'll, we'll, you can follow along as I read it and we'll conclude with this. Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.